Okay. I suggest that we uh, that we start with this uh, webinar. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good friends, uh, um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you in this uh, second event in the Open Education Week 2018, uh, organized by Eden, the European This is an e-learning network. Uh, the topic of the webinar today is uh, challenges for quality of open educational resources. Uh, my name is Wim van Petegem, I work at the University of Leuven, uh, and I'm Vice President of Eden, and it's a pleasure for me uh, to guide you through this uh, webinar. Um, we have uh, five more people involved in the webinar. Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Irina von Gutvicina from uh, the Votatus Magnus University. She is our president. Uh, I'm also happy to introduce uh, Martin Weller, who is the academic director for the Learning Design Project and director of the OER Hub uh, at the Institution of Educational Technology at the Open University in the UK. Uh, next is uh, Ulf Daniel Ehlers, uh, who is uh, working at the Baden-Württemberg Cooperative State University, Karlsruhe, uh, well known in the field, I think. Uh, um, the fourth one is uh, Gart Tittelstadt, uh, who is uh, Secretary General of ICD. Uh, I have to apologize, uh, Svetlana Kneatseva, who is from the UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies and Education. She would have loved to be here with us, uh, but she got ill uh, just yesterday, and uh, she apologizes. Uh, her voice is gone, and so she could not contribute uh, to the webinar but I'm sure that she will manage to see the recorded version of the webinar. And then last but not least, uh, Ebba Ossian Nilsson, uh, who is with the Swedish Association for Distance Education and also an Eden uh, Executive Committee member. Together, we prepared this seminar uh, around uh, the following questions. Uh, when talking about challenges uh, for um, quality of open educational resources, uh, we thought that the first question could be to think about what are the factors that have an impact on the quality of open educational resources uh, and open education in general. Uh, so we will start off the webinar with this question. Uh, then we will uh, dwell around the uh, idea of how do we then measure quality. If we know the factors, how can we then find evidence of quality for open educational resources? Uh, Third question is then uh, the more challenging one. Uh, how can we improve quality of open educational resources? Uh, and uh, what are then the measures that could be taken by the stakeholders involved, uh, the teachers, the institutions, uh, and the community in general, uh, maybe the European community? Fourth question was then, uh, OK, if we have that quality, uh, how can we then uh, go for some sort of accreditation, of formal recognition? And, uh, or do we need simply qualification like uh, we have the likes uh, as we know it in, in so many social media nowadays? How do we organize this kind of accreditation process? And last but not least, my favorite question. Uh, uh, it's not just us that need to think about quality and open educational resources, uh, but what about students? How can we involve the learners in the quality debate? Uh, we will go through all these questions in the webinar. Uh, each time, uh, there is two of us that will uh, introduce their viewpoints uh, and first thoughts, initial ideas. Uh, and then uh, I open the floor for the other panelists uh, to uh, introduce their viewpoints as well. The participants can ask questions in the chat box. Uh, if everything is OK, uh, you should see the chat box. Uh, and you can uh, ask questions uh, in general uh, or particularly related to one of these questions. Uh, when it is related to the questions, I take them right away in the discussion. Uh, if they are of a more general nature, I take the freedom to postpone them until the end of the webinar, where we will have a, lock, a last round of, of, of discussion with all the panelists. Uh, I think that's enough as an introduction. Uh, we have about one hour and a half uh, for this webinar, uh, and I don't want to lose time because I think uh, these questions uh, will spark a lot of discussion uh, 
and I'm looking forward uh, to that debate. Uh, so let's start with uh, the first question. Uh, I repeat it here. Uh, so talking about the quality of open educational resources and, and, and open education in general, what are then the factors that we could recognize, distinguish, uh, that have an impact on the quality of open educational resources? Uh, can I first uh, ask Ebba to give her viewpoint on, the, on, on this question? Uh. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wim, and thanks for the introduction, and hello to everyone at the webinar. Uh, yes, I would like to start with um, a sustainable, sustainability development goals from UNESCO, because I think uh, those uh, words which are written here on the slide uh, really have an impact and will have an impact uh, for uh, the development and the use of OER or open educational practices and culture as well. So the questions are about uh, equity, equality, access, inclusiveness, diversity, education for all, sustainability, and lifelong learning. Um, I also would like to say that I listened to you the President of Commonwealth of Learning yesterday at her speech for the Open Educational Week and the introduction from Commonwealth of Learning. And she also said that um, those um, honor, honor words are maybe the most import, important ones for everyone who are involved in the movement for open educational resources and how we deal with those uh, words. Uh, can I have the next uh, slide, please? Uh, I also think, uh, talking about quality, um, there is a very good uh, uh, framework, the TIPS framework, for quality for open educational resources. I think many of you are familiar with it, and it has been developed by Paul Cavacci. And how we deal with uh, those uh, four issues about teaching and learning processes, information and material content, presentation, product and format, and the system, system technical and technology are very important and um, will stimulate the development of the culture of quality for open educational resources. How they are used, reused, how we share them, how they are adapted, etc. And then um, this framework will also um, generally improve uh, teaching and learning uh, and the use of open education resources. Uh, can I have the next one, please? Maybe I can uh, change it myself. I also will stress um, that there are different levels. Uh, we used to talk about micro-level, meso-level, and macro-level. It is, of course, about the resources as such and the materials as such. And maybe that are more about micro-level, but it's also very much about the meso-level, how institutions, how faculties, how teachers, etc., uh, are dealing with, uh, with open education resources and the incentives for using uh, open education resources. And of course, the students' view as well, which is very important, which we will discuss a bit more later on. And then, of course, the macro level. How are organizations, universities, um, and the national organization, but also globally, uh, uh, dealing with the open education resources? And here again, I think it reflects very well how we deal with them and how we, we adapt and transform the, the SDG goals for education. Um, so, um, uh, other questions which I think is very important for, the, for impact is about the learners as collaborators, because they are using open educational resources to a very high extent, maybe more than we, we know about or think about, and they see the learners more as uh, collaborators or consumers. Uh, we also know that the infrastructure support is very important, again, about incentives, uh, having OER as support at your institution, et cetera, and the cultural sharing, which, which is very much about attitudes and, and values and how to cultivate a cultural sharing. It is very much about sustainability, uh, transformation, and uh, not at least about uh, policy costs. And all those factors have a great impact for uh, quality. Uh, so I think I will uh, stop there and uh, hand over to Martin, and then we are can discuss later on. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you Eva. Uh, Martin, Martin, it's your, your turn. turn. Uh, 
Okay, thanks, Eva. Thanks, Vim. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, I don't have slides, so I'm just going to uh, ramble incoherently for a bit. Uh, I think um, this is a very academic thing to do, but <laughs> it depends what you mean by quality. Um, and David Wiley often makes the point that when we talk about quality, what we often mean is production quality, you know, glossiness, which is very different from educational quality. Um, so what we mean by quality will differ depending on context. Um, Having said that, I think nice production quality does help, actually. Um, I've been working with uh, Open Textbooks in the UK, and we've been working alongside OpenStax, and just been able to take along a really good, high-quality open textbook. You know, their astronomy books, excellent, lots of nice, glossy pictures, to show it to people and say, this is an open textbook. They immediately go, oh, OK, they're good quality then. And so that kind of does matter, I think. Um, but having said that, you don't always want high production quality. It depends what your purpose is. So um, we run the OpenLearn uh, OER repository at the OU, and one of our findings was that people rarely adapted our material. You know, it's kind of CC license; you can take it and adapt it. But actually, because it's kind of very high quality, they it's almost perceived as all, as broadcast. Like that's good enough; we'll just take it and use it. Whereas I think if you want people to do things and to produce their own resources or adapt your stuff, sometimes lower quality gives a different message. So um, I used to talk about big and little OER. And I think sort of fairly cheap things that are made, you know, a lecturer talking to, <laughs> to the webcam is a bit boring. But you can do it then. And other people think, well, I can do that as well. So it depends what you want. If your aim is participation, then high quality can be off-putting. Um, so I think just bear in mind, quality varies and, and what its purpose varies. So I think some factors, uh, I think Eva covered these quite well. Um, I think funding does help, you know, um, I think we shouldn't expect this stuff to be done on, on part time at the, sort of on the periphery. If you, th if you think it's important, then we need to fund it, wherever that comes. Um, I work at the Open University and we've had for, for years a, a course team approach, uh, which is very kind of labor intensive and can be quite brutal at times. You, you produce what you think is a, a perfect draft of a course material and then you send it to your colleagues who just rip it apart. So, But I think the end product of that process is that you get good, high quality materials. So I think the review, collaboration, and input from different voices um, helps improve quality. Um, I think having a specific need is really good. So in terms of quality, if you need something that teaches you calculus tonight because you've got a test tomorrow, then if it does that, then it's good enough quality. So sometimes it wouldn't depend on your need. Um, Ease of use and adaptation, I think, is important if what we want is people to take it and, and modify it. So um, I think particularly we've seen that with some of the stuff around open textbooks. It's a really interesting idea to get students to start modifying those textbooks. That changes their relationship to, um, to, to resources. I think perception is important. So um, we've done projects with um, lots of educators and, and why they don't adopt uh, OER. And often that it's, they're worried about the perception that if they're using someone else's material, it makes them look as though they don't know what they're talking about it, and they've kind of fought hard for this status, and status is important. So I think allowing people to use OER and it not seen as undermine their position is important. And having students also, sometimes we, we use um, OER and course materials, and students say, well, I've paid you money to study, you know, particularly in the UK. Um, why are you giving me stuff that I could get for free elsewhere? So I think how we use it is important, how it's perceived. Um, and uh, as Eva said, I think evidence of impact is important as well. If you want people to adopt OER, then being able to point to some rigorous evidence that says this has had good impact over here, it's improved student retention, saved money, or improved student performance, those kind of things really, really matter. And that's what we've been doing with the uh, OER hub quite a bit. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, open. Okay, thank you, Martin, as well, uh, for these introductory thoughts. Um, I'm now going uh, to ask the other panelists uh, to give their uh, reaction on these first uh, ideas. Uh, Gart, can I start with you? Uh, have you um, uh, to add something or to question something or to challenge something that you just heard from Eva uh, or Martin? Well, just an observation, and uh, that is, I think that open education resources 
is the child from emancipation of education, democratization of education. And when you have a new child, I love it. In the class or at work, you know, the expectations very, very much among those that are going to relate to that child. Many has regarded open education resources as a kind of ugly duckling. Have you read the fairy tale from H.C. Anderson? You know, about the ugly duckling that everyone bullied because it was so ugly. But at the end of the day, it was child of a swan. So when the ugly duckling grew up, it became a swan and everyone admired it. I think it's a bit the same with the open education resources. It will take time for it to demonstrate its swan capacity. So that is my observation that we can set up a number of you know criteria, etc. But still the complexity of learning material and learning itself will require time and patience to understand what the quality of uh, the OER are and offer. I stop there. It's just a reflection to put OER into kind of historical context. Okay. Thank you, Gart. Uh, I like the uh, <laughs> your uh, comparison with a fairy tale. Uh, Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Ulf, you want to add something here? Or uh, you, you agree with uh, what has been said? Or? Um, hello to everyone from my side as well. Um, I agree to what has been said. Yes, I agree to what has been said. Um, I, I would still, I would like to add one thing or two things that is, um, uh, we have done a lot of work on this issue of open educational resources and quality. And we came to the conclusion that um, what we actually would like to talk about when we talk about quality of OER is the quality of the educational process. Um, and so we were starting to think if it is not more useful, actually, when we talk about quality of open educational resources, to extend the perspective a little bit and to talk about um, quality of open education or open educational practices. So all the practices which educators, teachers, professionals are actually employing uh, to bring open educational resources into an educational experiences. And um, we felt, and, and I feel very strongly, that the quality actually is in this interplay between the resources and the educational idea and the student and the lecturer's role in that. Um, and uh, so that, that's my strongest feeling uh, to, for, for, for this point, actually. Um, and the second smaller point is that I always like to, it, it's also a little bit academic maybe, but that's what I am, <laughs> um, an educational scientist. So um, I, I always feel that quality actually is, is in itself, it is a relational term. It is a term talking about an in-between. It's not a term talking about a result or an end or one pole of the equation. It's a term which is talking, it's targeting the in-between, it's the relation which we are talking about. So if the quality is in the relation, we actually always have to take into account all the ends which are uh, parts of this relation. So the student and the resource, or the student, the teacher and the resource. And the quality is then, let's phrase it like that, the, the negotiation result 
of what they all bring to the educational experience, so to speak, from a, from a more, let's say, philosophical uh, point of view. So these two points I find important in uh, this question, uh, and maybe I, I, I'd like to add to what has been said. Thank you, Bernadette. Okay, thank you, Ulf. Um, very interesting points, and, and I'm sure that we will address uh, them later also in the, in, in the discussion. Um, Irina, uh, can I invite you to, 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 to conclude, maybe? Thank you, Wim. Um, I think uh, some very important uh, elements have been mentioned here already so far, that actually we uh, have inside all the time when we start about when we start thinking about open educational resources, why they suddenly become open? Uh, why do we need them open? What uh, we expect from them? Uh, are we satisfied with the production and resources? Uh, are we satisfied with the way we use resources? And are we satisfied with the way how we may be involved in the production of the resources, in the editing of the resources, and in using them in educational setting? And uh, the best uh, probably is this uh, um, differentiation and different experience of uh, how uh, low quality perception provocates the improvement of the development of the resource, of the development of um, practices and education in general. So I think uh, the impact items that are now uh, broadcasted in the slide are very uh, correct ones. But if I had to emphasize, I would also emphasize the ones that Martin mentioned is actually collaboration and different input, uh, how all of us uh, contribute to OER development and what impact we reach with it. All of us, teachers, students, academics. So I think we will continue on that. Okay, thank you for these wise words, uh, Irina. Um, I think uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box uh, from the, the participants. Uh, uh, I can invite you again uh, if you have uh, immediate questions related to the, uh, the discussion uh, or to the viewpoints raised uh, uh, here in the, in, in the, in the panel, uh, please put your questions or challenges in the, in the chat box uh, and we will try to address them as soon as possible. Uh, but let's move on to the uh, second question we prepared for this panel. Um, and the second question was, okay, now we have heard a little bit about uh, uh, the different uh, ways to look at the quality of open educational resources uh, and what, uh, what is there at stake. Uh, but uh, how do we then measure the quality of open educational resources? Uh, is it necessary to measure the quality? And uh, where do we then find or how can we find evidence that there is quality in uh, open education? Uh, and uh, I invite uh, Gart uh, to open the floor uh, to answer this question. Yes. Uh, going back to this idea that open education resources was born from the huge massification of higher education, and the idea it is also born from democratization of knowledge, so if we have a mother and a father. Uh, and then the question is, when this race and come alive along in the education and learning system, what happens? Well, at a certain point, the, exist, the existing ruler, they want to keep things as they are. They will strike back. So a good sign of quality is that OER are massively attacked by, for example, publishers that want to protect their domain. So that is a classical conflict between the new and the old, and the new, born for mastication and democratization, want to replace, at least to some degree, the existing, existing um, 
ruler. So when that conflict happened, that is at least some kind of evidence of quality. Because if the OER were not of quality, was not was easy to show, they were poor, why should you strike back? That will only increase the conflict unnecessary. So in that situation, if it had low quality, I think there will be no massive attack on the OER. So that is at least my first reflection. The next thing is that with the internet came a number of questions. 20 years I participated in an OECD conference on e-commerce. And the big issue was that one searched the internet at that time for those that offered eternal life, eternal life. And already then, it was millions of offers for eternal life on the internet. You only had to have some money to buy it, right? So <laughs> that, of course, elevates the, the threshold for consumers, learners, and others to accept that something has quality. So we are into a new dilemma with the digitalization. And the digitalization also posed a new dilemma. And that is, if you compare benchmark as any normal citizen do, and you buy something or use something, whatever it's a car or an OER, you compare. So I think the OER are about, they're up against trip advisor, good read. You know, so it is a kind of, open debate about quality, which has not yet occurred that much when it comes to OER. So there are some challenges here. This said, I, I just want to conclude this reflection that when I present the OER, what is OER? I say it is learning materials. What is the difference between learning materials and OER? Nothing. What is the difference when it comes to quality? Nothing. So the only difference is in what the license says. For example, like the five R, as Willie says. So, so basically, I think that quality OER, it is the same as quality learning material in general. So there is no basic difference in my view. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Um, and uh, I've seen already one question. Uh, and there is more coming in uh, that are related to this uh, issue, uh, but we will come back to these questions uh, after uh, I uh, give the floor to, to Ulf to give his uh, uh, point of view. And, and make yeah, thank you very much, Wim. And um, I would um, like to think a little bit about this issue of learning and education. Um, and Long before, actually, open educational resources have uh, surfaced and seen the light, have, have been born, like God would, be, say, would, would, would say, um, there was already um, in education science um, a discussion uh, around the issue, what is good learning material? What is good learning design, actually? Uh, and um, it's always the same. <laughs> it's always the same. We always try by using learning design. Back then, the big word was inst instructional design for, for web-based trainings, for e-learning and so on. Uh, nowadays, we call it learning design um, or didactics, pedagogy. We always try to raise the probability of having impact. Uh, so when we talk about quality, actually, we talk about um, a, a, con a concept, an approach, which tries to describe uh, a bundle of activities, philosophies, methods, processes, which um, is trying to raise the probability of having impact. So that, that's, that's the ultimate goal of, of quality, when we talk about quality. And impact can be various things, of course. Uh, for the learner, it can be that uh, a transformational process is happening. Uh, that's what we usually um, aim at when we think about education. Uh, 
we don't, uh, you know, think about uh, quality in a way that uh, the ultimate goal of quality is uh, faultlessness or perfection. In, in education, we think that the ultimate goal of quality actually uh, is a transformation. The competence, the abilities, the skills of the learners should develop. The learner as a person should transform him or herself. So, and when you think about this issue and this aspect of quality for education, and then turn to open educational resources, the question would be, how can open educational resources contribute to um, achieve this aim of such a transformational quality education um, understanding? Um, and then turning back again to, to um, educational uh, science uh, research results, there, there, are, there are these you know, these, these paradoxes that uh, we know from research that if you have a high structured learner, so a learner who's very autonomous, who's uh, self-organized, uh, who's very conscious, who's very reflected, if you have a high structured learner, this kind of learners, this kind of student can learn with anything you give them, with anything. You don't need to think about quality in this in this case, of a certain quality. You don't need to think about a certain pedagogy. These learners, they will find their way. They will learn always. They will achieve. They are the achievers. But if you have um, uh, a low-structured learner, learners who are beginning, learners who are starting, learners who need help, learners who need guidance, then you need to think about what is the right concept, the right approach to guide them. And now again, turning to open educational resources. If you throw open educational resources into a classroom, uh, regardless the quality of the open educational resource, high structured learners will take these resources and will make sense of them. They will try to follow their route, they will try to develop. If you have low structured learners, it's not going to work. And that's the typical paradox which we have in quality. The best resource with the wrong target group is leading to terrible results. And the worst resource, whatever that is, you know, the, the worst resource with a target group who is very, very learning able, learning competent, will lead to a result which might be even uh, uh, very good. So that's the paradox of, of, of quality. That's why I always like to uh, think about the ed entire education process. Um, I think that for this exact question, how do we measure quality, we can say that um, for education and for educational management, we have a, a whole lot of, of methods, processes, uh, philosophies developed, standards, um, certification schemes, uh, criteria, which are uh, out there. Um, but still, uh, we always need to think about the target group in the end of the day. And the evidence is in the transformation process. Um, let me come to the end. I think that, that what is important is that we, we, have an, we have an old world. In the old world, we tried to think about standards. We tried to think about achieving a certain um, resource quality, a certain quality of an educational concept, and then applying this concept or the resource, and then thinking, okay, this is going to lead in average to good educational processes and good results. The new world of quality development will look much more into community orientation, much more into peer orientation, Learners are helping them to scaffold their learning between them. And teachers will much less play the role uh, of providing a material for a certain standard. So the new world is a world of social processes, of community-oriented quality reflections, uh, whereas the old world is more on thinking about the standard 
for the average target group. The new world will think about how to provide community-oriented environments in which open resources play one role to facilitate learning, but the social networks are playing another role to facilitate and validate learning. So these are my takes on, on this question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, meanwhile, there have been uh, a lot of questions in the chat box. Uh, but if I heard uh, both uh, uh, Gart and Ulf uh, telling their viewpoint, uh, I think many of the questions already got uh, at least part of an answer. Uh, there was a question about who needs to do the measurement, let's say, of, of quality. Uh, and uh, then there was uh, uh, Ulf already saying that it should be like an, an, uh, the community, the peers uh, that, that are involved in the social uh, uh, aspect uh, in, in the process. Uh, I think that another uh, question was, was uh, the quality uh, either of resources, either of the educational process. Uh, and I think that uh, this has also been addressed uh, both by Gart and, uh, and, and, uh, and Ulf, I think. There was uh, a question about uh, tools and standards and benchmarks. Uh, I think that also uh, this was addressed uh, by, by uh, especially, I think. Uh, but maybe uh, I missed some points, uh, and uh, I would. Tool question. So what are the best tools to develop quality? The last quality standard I have developed is called OpenACB Check, and it's a so-called open quality framework. That means there is a list of 35 quality criteria, but the aim essentially in the end under the line is that every faculty, school, organization, teacher is taking this list and is starting a reflection process by himself or herself or with the colleagues or within the community to think about which of these 35 quality criteria is for us, for our context, for our target group, for our stakeholders, for our funding schemes, for our aims, our educational sector, which is the correct one in the end of the day. Always taking into account the social aspects of the learners and the people who are around this educational setting there. And I think that's important for the future. We have to think in these open frameworks and not in the international standards which are actually misleading a little bit because um, they are, can only target the average in the end of the day. And education is not about the average. It's about the transformation of the individual. OK, thank you all for this addition. Uh, I, I just want to, to have a quick round. To the Actually, uh, your inputs uh, raised a lot of thoughts, and uh, um, especially with the understanding uh, of, uh, of the quality and the understanding of the quality of OER. And um, I have a lot of uh, questions myself, uh, and even think now, you know, that when we speak about the involvement of community, and uh, I think what you have mentioned actually is transformation of uh, the individual, but also the community within an organization and, uh, and uh, a region. Uh, there are rules that are introduced uh, for different uh, purposes, for different aims, um, for different systems. And uh, critical thinking, I guess, also is a very important factor uh, in which uh, way to go, in which uh, direction um, to be accompanied. Uh, so it is a tremendous shift uh, within the organization, a tremendous shift in um, academia. I know yesterday we had a very, very good uh, discussion on uh, uh, open universities. They are unique. Uh, today, when we speak about OER, I don't think we uh, emphasize uh, one or another level of education or one or another 
uh, type of university we think how OERs may be useful for all, for all of us and how we may uh, recheck uh, where we are and uh, what are our values and whether our decisions have been made uh, on proper, on proper um, elements and segments in the process. It's, a, it's not a question actually, so I don't know if, if you get what I mean, but I think it's very important and I see it now so broad uh, that it's uh, very difficult actually uh, to make it more concrete. Uh, thank you, Irina. It's for sure a complex question, and uh, there is still more questions actually uh, than, than there is answers yet. Uh, but with the help of the community, we will probably be able to uh, to address some of them at least. Uh, I quickly go to input, to input from the God and Anul. Uh, yes, of course, I agree very much with what has been said. But um, I would maybe like to add, first of all, the question, how do we measure quality, is a bit uh, problemat problematic. Because uh, measure maybe is not the, the right word here. And also often when we are thinking about measure and measurements, we are quite often falling in, in this you know old uh, traditional way of measurements and the uh, measurement special on quality in this case. So um, quality is very much uh, about uh, quality in the eyes of the beholder. For the for which person, for which, what purpose, and uh, in what, which uh, context. So it is very um, depending uh, about the person's um, uh, purposes and context. So that's uh, one reason why it is so difficult. Uh, Ulf men men mentioned, and I think it was um, uh, also here in the chat, about benchmarking. I think uh, benchmarking is a very, very good way of um, at least discussing quality because then you are evaluating yourself and your own context and the purpose and the target group. So peer review and uh, the community uh, which has been mentioned. Uh, so that is uh, something. And then there's another thing and that is about where is the evidence. Uh, I think the evidence are by the learners, by the people. <clears throat> because they have the power, what they are using and how they are using it and why and what it means for them. Uh, I, I sometimes can see parallels, for example, you know, with uh, booking.com or TripAdvisor or this kind of thing. <clears throat> when you build some kind of community where you trust people and people have given their, their value of something. Uh, that has also been discussed for open education resources. Some year ago there was a conference about uh, OER open batches. And if OER should be, should be, I think there was an EU, EU project about it. If that should uh, be connected with some kind of, you know, batches for different kind of purposes. Uh, but I don't really believe in that idea either because um, yeah, it changed very much. Uh, it is like we are shooting on a moving target um, because um, uh, things are, the, the meaning of OER is that they are developing all the time, especially when we, have to adapt them, we, we use them, we maybe translate them, we, we have them in other contexts and this kind of things. So the, the purpose of OER is that it is moving. So that's why I think it's more um, more better to, to talk about what also was mentioned both by myself but also by the Garden Earth about the open, the, the, the open culture and the open practice. Because everyone is involved and I also mentioned about that um, the different kind of levels. It is the resource as such, it is the larger community and maybe from a, a government or the country or what, where it is used. So it is on different kind of levels as well. But the evidence is very much on behalf of the users. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eva. Uh, I'm or, uh, doing the next question, so perhaps I'll respond to it as I do that part anyway. So I'll I'll pass as a response to this, cover it in the next bit. Okay, good. I uh, I think uh, I could uh, very much agree with you, Martin. So uh, let's see how I can uh, this, uh, this slide. Here we are. 
So the next uh, question that we would like to address is then, okay, measure, uh, measuring quality, and it was already put between brackets, measuring uh, that this is uh, maybe not uh, the right word there, uh, but still we can talk about uh, how can we improve quality uh, and, and uh, what is then the important actions to, to be taken by all stakeholders involved, starting from teachers over the institution. Thanks, Vim. Uh, yeah, so I think um, sort of slightly going back to the previous point, I, I lived through the what no one calls the learning object wars at the end of the 1990s, and they became really bogged down in kind of over-engineering metadata and definitions and measurements of quality. So I think my first point is let's not over-engineer anything around quality with um, OER. Uh, but how we might improve quality, I think. First of all, it, it's just a kind of an awareness raising thing. It's like if people aren't aware there are good OERs out there, then you can have all the fine quality you want, but people just don't come across them. So I think um, so kind of just raising awareness and ease of use of, um, uh, of OERs helps. Um, I think easy adaptation, there's still often just a, a slight technical barrier. You know, it's like you can download this in XML format or whatever. It's like, but they're not easy to adapt a lot of OERs and actually when you can get more, going back to my first point, you know, about uh, an earlier point about um, is that that collaborative process that really improves quality. So I think we can improve quality by making them easy to adapt. Um, and allied to this, I think we need to raise the game on recognition. So um, institutions need to reward people if they're going to produce OERs, or if you're using OERs, then that's it's seen as a valuable thing to do. So if people if people are rewarded for it and recognised for it, then they'll use them and produce them, and that in itself leads to good quality. Um, you might want a, a policy around uptake, so uh, institutions or um, regions or national governments kind of try and promote uptake. Um, I recently put a proposal which sort of got mired in various committees that, you know, in, in, in my own university, perhaps we should say a certain percentage of every new course is made from OERs. That's partly a, a kind of an efficiency thing, but also just I think it helps just bring in different perspectives. It helps make your course easily adaptable to other things. So you could have those kind of things. And I think as soon as you started pushing the uptake, the kind of demand, then that would drive quality also. Uh, another kind of area for improving quality is to make the, the providence of OERs much more. Uh, available and and prominent, I think. So people know they're getting stuff from a, a good provider that tends to to drive the quality of others. Uh, I think some of the stuff that I, I think Gard was talking about, you know, things like um, ratings and trust factors. That as long as they're easy to use, the kind of the equivalent of TripAdvisor, whatever, you know. So, but make those things fairly light, I think. Um, and another way is to sort of slightly to the side, but I think another way you might improve the quality is to is to rethink pedagogy. So um, a more open approach means that that resource is fulfilling a different role in how you teach rather than just a straightforward kind of delivery model. So uh, to go back to the example of open textbooks, if what we're interested in is our students themselves adapting a textbook and making it suit their own curriculum, then that will drive the quality around that type of pedagogy. Whereas if we're just saying, here's something you're going to receive from someone else, then we're looking for slightly, we're looking more at that kind of broadcast quality rather than educational quality. Um, I'll park it there and pass over. Okay, thank you, Martin. That's already quite a list of uh, measures that we can take to improve. No, yeah, I, I think um, um, this question is actually a, a very, very good question. <laughs> First of all, it's um, it's not so easy to to find the golden 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 bullet uh, answer to to this question. The last time we we had in a in a project which was called the Open Educational Quality Initiative, um, we had uh, ha have asked this question. We we came to the conclusion that actually, probably to improve quality. Um, of open education resources use. We need to think about a whole system approach. So we need, of course, policies for the organization to, um, to um, uh, 
set the direction that what is valued in the organization is um, an open access, open publishing, open education um, philosophy. Uh, we need, of course, also um, on the level of the educators, the educational professionals, we need um, support for them to, to publish their resources free and openly. We need um, uh, to have a risk-free environment, so to speak. Um, uh, I can tell you the, the story in, in, in my institution. Um, we have at one point uh, set up a, a platform for sharing resources. And uh, we needed to sort us all sort out all these nitty gritty little details, so that people are not afraid to share their resources. Actually, um, because um, people are afraid out of all all, all kinds of uh, reasons, um, if they maybe forgot to uh, delete a picture where they don't have the intellectual property rights for or if the resource may be not a good resource and so on and so it was a total failure this, this platform to to share resources was a total failure in our institution and then we started with another concept which um, was uh, a concept to address the issue of community and trust between the professors in my institutions and this concept we called open content clubs and so we said you the professors you are not asked to share your resources freely but what you can do is you can build a closed or also an open club with three or four or five colleagues on this platform if you choose others are allowed to look in there if you choose not others are not allowed to look in there and then suddenly um, people started to use that actually. We have 760 professors, we have nine campus, on all nine campus 100% uh, of our curriculum is taught. Um, so these clubs actually were a perfect um, idea to start to share resources there. And um, the interesting thing is that after some time we started discussions and a little bit like uh, very, very qualitative surveys and we found out that each of these clubs have their own implicit or explicit quality procedure. So some of them had a peer review, some of them only used material which was uh, already uh, standard for the last 10 years uh, with long experience of usage, uh, lecture materials. Um, some of them used uh, to share um, bought commercial materials. Uh, some of them had had no explicit quality improvement mechanism, but had an, an, an implicit one, you can say, that they said, um, well, we are talking about it with our students sometimes, some were using evaluation and so on. So the whole issue to see, say is that uh, in order to improve quality of open educational resources, I think what, what we need is this kind of, of community and openness in sharing and exposing what we do as professionals with our materials to the other professionals and daring, having the courage uh, to criticize. And this can take place when trust is existing, actually. So these issues uh, in educational institutions which need to be worked on is trust so that sharing and quality improvement and quality consideration of what has been shared uh, is uh, rising. So it was a saying, we need policies, we need educational professionals who are aware of quality improvement mechanisms. And of course, we also need learners um, who are guided to use open resources and also to build their own resources and share that learners' resources. Um, I think this, this, this is my most important point, that quality um, will build in environments where communities trust each other, the individuals of communities uh, trust each other.
Okay, thank you, Ulf. Uh, that co is, is nicely in line with also uh, what Martin also said about uh, trust factors. Uh, so. Uh, uh, yes, um, yes, I think there were very many um, wise words uh, which have been, has been said. Uh, I think uh, the institution has a really uh, key role. Um, I mean, of course, the teachers and the authors as well, but uh, it is very much about um, uh, awareness rising, uh, to build, cultivate a, a culture of quality and about openness and about sharing. And that is very much uh, up to the institution and also very much about uh, leadership because uh, there need to be uh, other kind of um, um, how you allocate resources, how you allocate time, how you, uh, what kind of incentives there are for teachers to work on, on uh, using an OER. Uh, and I think also there, there, there are two sides maybe, both of course for the, for the learner's perspective and the teachers, but there's also this systemic uh, um, change which are needed. Uh, where the institution really play a, a large role, and I think that was, as Irina said, for another question that that was raised very much yesterday uh, for the open university on the open universities uh, sessions. How we, I mean, the whole educational system need to to rechange and be reconstructed. And then I also think that um, um, a lot will happen, maybe not automatically, but uh, um, bit. Bit, bit, bit for bit, and um, as God was saying earlier on, that it takes some time. But the use of open pedagogy is very, very important, I think, and how how we apply to to that and reply, and how we um, adapt an open pedagogical approach, because there is open education resources included, and the whole area of openness and open education practice and culture. So I think uh, if we uh, uh, embrace the the um, approach of open pedagogy, a lot of things also will be maybe be be changed. So more discussions about that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Eva. Um, why there is uh, some some, some discussion going on in the chat box, uh, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, I think uh, some of the issues have already been addressed, but there is one particular question that has not been addressed yet, uh, and that was uh, a question about uh, could it be that there are like different ideas of quality between young people and experienced ones? Uh, I think that uh, when it comes to improving quality, that, that intergenerational uh, idea uh, or learning could also be uh, something interesting. Uh, and I, I, I was just wondering, Garth, uh, maybe I'm sorry, Wim. I said maybe I should follow the example of Martin here and because I will speak on the next team, so maybe I could connect that reflection to the next team. Okay. Okay, perfect. Then I, I give the floor to Irina. Maybe she can address that particular question on the. the uh, yes, I think uh, over this issue as well, and uh, you know. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, teachers uh, at schools change their uh, point of view towards creative uh, ideas that come from children, you know, and, and sometimes they are amazed, they don't know what to do with it, they don't know how to uh, integrate and provide space uh, for the children to develop their own ideas. Uh, uh, then uh, the children from primary school grow towards uh, uh, teenage, teenagers and I think they become more and more closed inside. And I think this might be a metaphor for us uh, despite of the age that we have. If we do not receive support on the early development of the idea, or if this development must be stopped, 
you know, uh, before we reach our results due to very different reasons. Uh, some education policy, some organizational policy, uh, national or European or whatever it is, some uh, quality assurance standards uh, that, are, that we are obsessed sometimes about in Europe, especially with the programs and courses, then uh, the good ideas are um, abandoned. And uh, also, um, if me as a teacher and as an educator um, lacks some technical uh, skills using sophisticated tools, as Martin said, to adapt the OERs towards the environments that are used within my institution. Then this also is the reason that I will drop the idea out. So I would say that generation, as well as um, quality, uh, I also read that some uh, more advanced and uh, more experienced users would maybe have a different approach to quality uh, than less experienced users. I think these factors might be uh, categorized into the same category. I think experience, age, uh, skills in different areas. And this, um, this comes uh, to one recommendation from my side, support. Uh, support systems for the users. And I think uh, this is what we should think about. I now talk on the perspective of Eden and other professional communities. I think we need to think about how to support these people um, who pick up these ideas, who come with crazy ideas and start implementing. And thank you for all good comments to previous speakers. Well, if I interpret that this question, accreditation that brings to my mind some kind of agency that do a consideration and come out with a decision, accredited or not, like brings my thinking to LinkedIn, Facebook. Risk advisor, good weeds, and all that. And I think basically none of them. Why? The idea of learning and learning materials is, of course, a question about incentive. It is, of course, a question of a knowledge and be a knowledge. The mutual respect that builds trust between people. So basically, I think that the responsibility of quality has to be by those that create the OER. That is my, my basic view. And um, the next, coming from the same, would be that, well, one could imagine in the future that you had some kind of accreditation of system, accreditation where a part of the accreditation in university, for example, gets is its capacity and quality culture that is delivering and consuming OER. Yeah, but the responsibility and the accountability for quality, in my view, has to be by the creator. Whatever that is, the original creator, 
the adapter, the student, or whatever. So in the end of the day, you will then ask, well, if that is the case, how can we, the users, we, the society, know that this is quality if it is the creator that is accountable? I would say that for those that are providing OER, it is a great responsibility that they claim quality. Why? Well, as it is like with the taxes, right? Why do you declare your salary and all that to be taxated by, by government? Who would do that voluntary? We do that voluntary in our part of society because we trust that will lead to the better good. And in the same way, I think that by declaring quality, that you are transparent on what kind of quality systems you have, on what kind of level you deliver quality, will be extremely helpful to create trust and also to guide for usability. So I think I stopped here. I'm not against likes. I like likes when they are used in, in that kind of challenging way. But I think I said that responsibility and accountability has to be by the creator and that we need transparency and claiming quality. Thank you. Either, sorry, either you use peer reviews, teacher reviews, or just use it in the curricula, for example. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Gart. Uh, I like the, uh, the way that you link together responsibility, accountability, uh, at the one hand by the creators, uh, but also trust uh, from the institution and the community in general, uh, and that combines nicely to what, uh, what, what you call a quality culture. Uh, that's a very nice uh, way of, of putting things together, I think. Uh, uh, Martin, can I ask you uh, some first reflections on that? Uh, do you agree? Uh, um, um, I think we need easy things that people can kind of see a stamp. Um, I think one of the problems that um, OER really has is just kind of brand recognition. Um, and that's very difficult to compete with against kind of big publishers who kind of push stuff out. And um, so when we ask people about um, where do you get your online resources from, they say, you know, YouTube, Google, Khan Academy, maybe TEDx, that's it. No one mentions OER. That's because all of our um, efforts are kind of distributed. So I think there is a kind of need for a kind of brand thing. Um, so maybe that does kind of come to a, a formal recognition that you're, you're part of the club. Um, and we've tried this a bit with MOOCs in Europe with uh, the Open Up Ed uh, thing with a kind of quality brand. Um, but it, it needs it needs money and it needs a lot of effort and I, I still do worry about the kind of we'll end up with a very formal kind of very academic type solution that just completely destroys all the all the fun and <laughs> all the experimentation in the process and I think a lot of what's attractive about OERs is that they are kind of lightweight and you can do different things to them and you can experiment and those kind of things and I think that, so people like Jim Groom for those who know him you know and what he does with DS106 for him, open education OER is very different from a, about a license or a, a quality badge, but they do really interesting experimental things. I wouldn't want us to introduce anything that, that kind of crushes that innovation, if you like, and makes it too dry. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, I, I, I like that. that let's say the the, the, uh, the way that you put two things uh, a bit in in, in the um, position of each other. Uh, thank you. I agree with uh, God's uh, reflections. Um, and as I said earlier, I think uh, just to look at the OER as such, uh, it is. Um, I mean, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier also that uh, from you, Martin, that maybe some um, so-called bad uh, OERs maybe have a purpose for some learners and in that way they can be good or some more professional uh, developed OERs maybe uh, or maybe not not as good as uh, 
because they are in wrong, in wrong context and for wrong purpose and for wrong target group. So uh, I think it is very difficult that also uh, accreditation is, it is used to, that term used to be used for, an, you know, a national agency who really, I mean, take the whole perspective of something. And um, as we are, is a new, um, is uh, developing all the time. And I think uh, maybe the best, the best uh, quality qualification, so to say, uh, if we shall use that term, is that if a, a resource is used, uh, if it has a purpose, if it is reused, if it is maybe translated, if it is used in different kind of contexts, etc., then um, it is a qualified uh, 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 very much, I, I would say. So the, the users in the community have a huge uh, power and, and impact here how we shall uh, deal with it and how, we shall, how it will be recognized. So again, the, the use and the community perspective is important. Thank you. If I use this, if Did you ask something, Wim? Okay. Uh, yes, if I was, uh... Yes, Eva, I was uh, I think all who who are involved have a have a responsibility. Uh, of course, uh, the the teacher or the author of the we are have one responsibility, and that is also used to be be claimed that there are already some kind of you know, measurement steps. Because first of all, if I I create something. I will not uh, uh, leave it for free if I'm not uh, happy or satisfied with it. So that is the first quality step, so to say. And also if it is created uh, within a university, for example, university will not um, uh, let teachers or academics uh, have their OERs in their name if, if it is bad quality. So we already have some kind of quality steps. But I think very much it's, it's uh, the users, because it is, uh, in the end of the day, it is the user who are benefiting from the open education resources. Okay, thank you, Eva. Yes, now. Sorry, I didn't. You called me up. <laughs> uh, to save time, I also can transfer the comment to the final question because I know uh, that I will be talking about. Can you the floor for uh, your thoughts on this question? Uh... I can uh, say that um, I have been involved in accreditation the last six years as a vice president of my institution. And um, the people in my institution, they always draw a fine line between accreditation and quality. <laughs> and um, I think that's, that's because uh, everybody understands that accreditation, so to speak, uh, has a lot to do with, uh, with the context of tax paying uh, taxpayers uh, and customer protection issues uh, for certain contexts in higher education, uh, for example. And um, if you have an open educational resource, you don't really have a. You, you're not not always. You you not always have a have a certain context. So the accreditation issue here, I think, is is a really tricky one. That's the point I wanted to make. Question. I would like to move to the last question then, uh, and uh, that is uh, about uh, the role of students, the learners themselves, uh, consider them as users of, of Okay, thanks, Wim. 
Um, actually, uh, the issue uh, of involvement of students and learners in OER use and development is, I think, um, cross question in this discussion. Um, I didn't find actually better statistics, maybe it's my um, ignorance, uh, but uh, I loved this OER evidence report because I found very concrete data uh, in one place. And, uh, you know, I was thinking who students and learners are. Sometimes uh, we uh, think uh, that we all are students and we all are learners, especially with the advent of uh, non-formal learning. And I think uh, it is inevitable that very soon we will uh, make um, accreditation systems and um, quality agencies uh, recognize these supplements in, in our diplomas. I hope so, and I think this way, and I think this will be, be happening soon. And uh, uh, talking about this, um, I think it is important how we all see uh, the evidence and the use, and as Ulf mentioned previously, I try now to, to make several links, um, the impact of OER, which means also improvement of the quality, if I follow you correctly, on education and on uh, formal studies. So we see that uh, I highlighted two uh, statements in red, which adapt resources to fit uh, our needs, and uh, use OERs to get new ideas and inspirations. And I think this is linked very much to what we started with about the incentive and motivation and actually the internal flame that we all get when we see that we may improve something or may add or may contribute with something from our side to the better resource, to the better education, to the better scenario. But uh, here I must admit that um, uh, my uh, internal belief is that students and learners should be allowed to do that, should be able to do that. And uh, there should be conditions created. So um, if uh, the link may be made with the recognition of um, open learning and the OERs as uh, learning resources. I think it may happen that learners and students will choose OERs as better learning resources and they will be choosing those that give credit and give um, important information that God says provided by the authors of OER. And I would never now select a course, despite of the fact that it would be very interesting for me as a learner, if I don't see clear indication how and where I could accredit it and how and where it is linked with the qualifications or formal studies or a company requirements that is going to employ me as a professional. I think this comes with the autonomous learners, um, with the uh, conscious learners who select consciously the institution that act responsibly. So I think that um, students and learners are already and will be even more contributing to the dispute on the, on the quality of OER when they will be allowed to suggest how to improve the quality when they will be able to modify them and adapt them for their purposes. And um, uh, when curriculum designing, despite of if it is open or closed uh, for, let's say, uh, some experimenting, uh, um, uh, piloting uh, of curriculum, allows them to get involved into the processes. When uh, our environments are open and um, they can participate in development of these environments and also uh, make impact and influence. And I think when they can consciously assess the impact of OER from their learning, and all of this is not uh, 
made up for your comment, but yes, when they are able to use OER to establish open educational practices. I think um, uh, this is uh, a must uh, condition. And uh, we uh, already have examples uh, from um, formal studies when certain uh, open educational practices even become OERs. So they work in virtual learning environments, they create some artifacts in groups, but then they are published as OERs for modification, adaptation, and reuse. So I think this also might be happening vice versa. So OERs to OEPs, and then OEPs to OERs. And I think this is a big change also in the process. So um, these are just short examples and considerations. Maybe now I will open the floor for your reactions and comments, but I think the next slide is not. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so I will continue uh, about the students' perspectives and the learners' perspective, perspectives. And I have this slide. But again, because I think it is so really important, because um, both in the learners' perspective uh, and for the educational perspective, it is um, uh, education is a question of a democracy, and to be and to involve um, uh, everyone. So I, I like to have this slide again. Um, open education resources and open education practices and cult open education educational um, culture is about equity, quality, access, inclusiveness, diversity, and education for all, and sustainability, lifelong learning. And all those words um, apply uh, to a very high extent to, from to the learner's perspective. How can they have access? How can we uh, embrace diversity from the learner's perspective? How can we embrace education for all? We talked about uh, different kind of age groups, uh, et cetera, earlier on. And how can we provide um, learning possibilities in a lifelong perspective? Uh, so it is very much about uh, equality and equity. Um, <clears throat> recently, uh, there was a, um, uh, an article published in Inside Higher Education in December 2007 by Christina Hendricks, and um, she wrote about the students' vital role in open education resources. Maybe some of you have seen it or read it. But she uh, argued very much, and uh, that is my claim as well, that um, uh, students have a vital role in um, embracing, uh, facilitating um, quality assurance. So to, if we still use that concept, uh, open education resources. Uh, and that the, she also claimed that learners learned much more and to a, in a deeper aspect and that they learned very much about culture differences, about uh, diversity, about different kind of perspectives on a special topics than they did with the so-called so traditional learning material, materials. And um, doing so, uh, she also claimed that um, learning in that way make an impact uh, on the world, not just for the, the learning as such for the students, but also their uh, impact in the world as a, as a global citizen. So students have a really vital role, and that's exactly what Irina also stressed and uh, also, also mentioned in this report from OER Hub, that um, learners, students, use OER to a very high extent because they are interested in a special topic. They would like to learn. They would like have an idea about something. So they do it, uh, even if it is not really promoted or always uh, from the educational formal settings. So yes, students have a vital role, and we have to um, give them and allow them to take that responsibility. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, I also would like to, um, to uh, argue uh, and uh, show what uh, David Billy is um, writing uh, about assignments. And uh, he, he did it in, in the way for open education, because I think um, 
OER is not just a question of the OER as such, it is about open education approach. And um, we all know that assignments uh, are maybe one of the most uh, um, steering element in the educational uh, system nowadays because students learn for the exams. And that's why I, I would like to claim uh, that we, we need also to uh, not ju just uh, change the curricula and the way uh, teaching and learning are uh, delivered, but also very much how we um, uh, made the assignments and the exams and how they are, are done. So, so um, Willie uh, raised the question about um, how can assignments as such uh, be built on open educational resources? Which, uh, I think that that was what, what you mentioned as well, Irina, about, about how can students for their exams um, take responsibility to use all this kind of OERs and to build further on upon what is, all, upon what is already done and to work, uh, to work in a more deeper way to maybe do something something themselves and to maybe revise or adapt or whatever or translate uh, OER which already are there or maybe put some new elements in it because that is the way the OER movement can move further on. Uh, and it, that is also more motivating for, for the learners to not just uh, study for for the exam and for the subject and the topic and such, but to be more involved in this um, learning process, which is useful both for the students or, and for the learners, but also for the community, and in the end of the day for wider uh, public as well, so that, <clears throat> so they can feel that they are more uh, collaborators. I think that was one of the words I mentioned already in the in the, the first slide I, I had for, the, for this session to to work with the students as collaborators because they have an, an enormous potentials. So I think I will uh, end by this, and um, then we can discuss. Sorry, was that, was that me? Sorry. Okay, sorry, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I, I think they've uh, both touched upon things that I've already uh, already raised. I think this idea of getting students to engage with material, and if that's the case, then uh, two things need to happen. One is it needs to be easy for them to, you don't want there to be a technical barrier um, in doing that, because it takes up too much of the kind of the real estate of the course to explain how to do it. But also there needs to be a kind of pedagogic shift, I think, in that um, you change the way that you teach so that students feel that this is a, a valuable thing to do and that sort of co-creating the curriculum in a way becomes a, 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 an academic exercise. So um, it's no good just saying, here's some material, go off and do something with it. That needs to be part of how you, you structure your course overall. But I think that both those points are covered very well. Okay, thank you. I like uh, what, what you said, the word co-creator, uh, I think that... No, just uh, to reinforce that I am very, very convinced that students uh, are very, very aware of their needs and their interests and their objectives and their goals. And if they are not, <laughs> then they need to be, then we need to work on that as educators to make them aware of their, their um, their ways, their pathways, which which they need to to learn. I, I said it in the beginning that I'm very much a fan uh, or in favor of this uh, transformational quality uh, understanding that education and learning is a transformational process, and that already gives the indication that I think that the learner is really in the center, and we need to do everything to involve the learner into making an ally in the educational experience to shape it as a co-creator like Martin and others said um, so that he or she is having really a key role a the key role uh, in, in the quality debate
I think that is the area that is most under mostly not well understood when it comes to OER, and that I would justify by observing the aspect of innovation, social innovation that is not yet uh, not yet we have taken the benefit as we could. So uh, this is an area that I think we all should explore much more that how can the capacity of students and teachers be increased by triggering the social innovation aspect from the OER. So that of course, that of course goes for the quality of the learning. Thank you. Thank you, Gar. Okay, uh, that, that's a very interesting point. Uh, I like the way that you link it to, to uh, social innovation and how to, to uh, introduce that in education. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear panelists and uh, dear participants from a distance, um, we are uh, at the end of the, of the webinar. Uh, I promised that I would ask all panelists uh, to conclude uh, with one uh, takeaway from this webinar. Uh, I, because the time is running and we are already a bit over time, uh, I, uh, I allow them to, to summarize this whole webinar in just one sentence, uh, just one uh, idea that uh, you think that uh, all participants uh, of this discussion uh, should take away. And uh, it might be related to one of the questions. It might be related to uh, uh, something that popped up during the discussion. Uh, but uh, it, I cannot allow you to, to elaborate. Yeah, OK, I'll go with uh, keep OER fun and uh, make them accessible to everybody. Uh, can you uh, give your takeaway message uh, from this webinar, please? Uh, we build better the OER community on quality. Very nice. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Ulf, I switch to you now. Nice, nice. Thank you very much. Uh, Garth, can I uh, move to you? Sorry, I support Martin. Sorry, I didn't understand you, Garth. The takeaways are the joy of learning and to involve uh, and include uh, learners in the uh, in the discussion at uh, uh, okay, all time levels. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Eva, can you summarize uh, or uh, give one uh, message for the participants? Uh, I guess it's speaking, but I didn't hear you yet. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe. I think two, two, two sentences short. One, I think uh, education uh, uh, will matter. Can you summarize or uh, can you give you uh, your last thought on the, uh, the, 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 the webinar? The second one is and, uh, try that to I'm summarize very happy one question, that you one are here question or one will idea. continue supporting those yeah. who go for.
Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I think that at this moment, uh, this is a very uh, uh, was a very nice discussion. Uh, I thank all the panelists uh, for sharing their thoughts and, and contribute uh, to a very fruitful uh, uh, sharing of ideas. Uh, and in the, uh, I also thank the participants from a distance uh, for all their uh, questions and remarks and. and input for the discussion. Uh, uh, it was uh, so lively that I couldn't follow uh, time myself, uh, and I'm, I was happy that others were answering and reacting on the messages popping up there. Uh, in a good tradition of open educational uh, discussion, uh, we will provide you with a link to the uh, recorded uh, version of this webinar so that you could use it yourself uh, as a resource for other uh, purposes. Uh, and uh, I also thank uh, thanks Eden for organizing this, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to announce that uh, this series of events uh, started yesterday uh, with already one debate, uh, today with another debate, and tomorrow with again another debate. Uh, tomorrow it will be at 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, and it will be about the topic, uh, grassroots open educators at work challenges and ideas. Uh, I think something to look forward to and uh, I, I, would, uh, I, I would, I'm glad to invite you to the webinar as well. You can find all the information on the website for this Open Education Week. Uh, so it was my pleasure to be the bother